Hi, my name is Saurabh Kandawal, and I'm a bariatric surgeon at the University of Washington. I'd like to thank Dr. Rogers and the rest of our panel today for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about early leaks after bariatric surgery. I have nothing to disclose. As I said today, we'll be focusing on management of leaks following a bariatric operation in the early postoperative period. The principles we'll be talking about today pertain to both gastric bypass and sleeve, or any bariatric operation for that matter. And these really focus on common general surgery techniques, some tips, and also a discussion about certain specific options that are available depending on resources and patient stability. So how often does this happen? If you look at the literature, the incidence of leaks varies between 0.1 and 8%. Certainly was higher in early series, and as techniques improve, consolidation of cases to higher volume centers and centers of excellence, today we see these centers typically demonstrating a leak rate of less than 1% with either of those two operations. Leaks happen due to tissue factors, technical factors, and ischemia. Uh, what has become much more prevalent nowadays is intraoperative testing to evaluate for leaks. This will help detect an immediate technical concern, such as a stapler misfire or sutures placed too far apart, and gives the opportunity to repair and retest before concluding the operation. This intraoperative testing is often done in conjunction with anesthesiology colleagues, such as using an Ewald or nasogastric tube for insufflation and methylene blue testing, or using intraoperative endoscopy with submersion and insufflation testing, which is the method that we use. But we're not talking about those leaks today. We're really talking about postoperative leaks. And postop leaks are similar to what you see in other areas of gastrointestinal surgery as well. The majority will happen within the first few days of surgery, with one notable exception being the sleeve gastrectomy, where patients can present with a leak even six to eight weeks after the operation. What's clear is that with enhanced recovery pathways, decreased length of stay, and earlier discharges, uh, we're often sending patients home within the time window during which a leak can occur. So patient education about signs, symptoms of what to watch out for, as well as efficient methods of managing them if they present with urgent or emergent uh, presentations is critical. Let's talk about one case. So your partner performs a routine anticholic moon y gastric bypass on a 45-year-old patient who has a BMI of 43, sleep apnea, and diabetes, and reflux. Your partner then goes out of town and asks you to cover for them. You're called on post-op day one, and what was noted overnight was the following. The patient had decreasing urine output, a temperature of 99, a blood pressure of 110 over 70, which is somewhat softer than the day before, but more concerning, upper trending pulses, which started in the 80s, progressed to the 90s, and now in the hundreds and hundreds and tens. Pulse spectrometry shows 93% O2 saturation on two liters nasal cannula. On exam, the patient appears uncomfortable with tenderness in the epigastrium, mild tachypnea, but is otherwise stable and not in any significant distress. So what do you do first? Well, you wanna make sure it's not something else. Uh, leaks, pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, cardiac issues can often present with overlapping symptoms. And a reasonable approach to this is to quickly get an EKG, a chest film and some blood work uh, as you go to evaluate the patient. If you think the patient is unstable and it's not an acute cardiopulmonary concern, that patient should go directly to the operating room. Barring that situation, however, we typically employ a liberal use of imaging. And often this is either using CT or upper GI imaging. And as always, you have to be aware of false negatives associated with both of these tests, which can be as high as 30%. An upper GI x-ray requires an awake cooperative patient as well as an in-house radiologist to perform this exam. A CT uh, can often be done with fewer resources and have these, it has the advantage of being able to help diagnose both PE if you run through the chest as well as abscess and evaluate from multiple sites of leak. It's important to remember that patients do not need to ingest full oral contrast. IV contrast is often enough. We typically have patients ingest oral contrast on the way down to the scanner, and this is often enough to illuminate the proximal anastomosis. You've got to remember your anatomy, look at the op report, and figure out what was done and how they did it. If you're thinking about this example, which is an anticholic wound and gastric bypass, 
you've got to look at the four sites where people are going to leak. It could be the pouch staple line, number one, a gastrojejunostomy, which is number two, which is the most common site. Gastric remnant staple lines is denoted by number three, and also the distal anastomosis of the jejun or jejunostomy, which is number four. This is the least common site and sometimes one that tends to present later due to its variable uh, presentation. I put number five, but I don't have an image. If you think of a sleeve gastrectomy being done, which is essentially one long staple line, a leak can happen in any aspect of it. However, the vast majority occur at the very proximal extent of it. These are some upper GI images which show leak after both gastric bypass and sleeve as denoted by the arrows and uh, are good examples of what you would find with this imaging study. What happens next really depends on how stable the patient is and what resources you have. A clinically unstable patient needs to go to the operating room and the things we're doing there are common general surgery principles. This typically involves an open or laparoscopic damage control operation to treat the sepsis. Concepts are familiar to all of us. Washing out the abdomen, suture closure if appropriate, omentopexy is often employed in drain placement. It's important to note that early leaks which occur within the first 72 hours are going to be more amenable to getting some closure with suture. Beyond that time frame, that success significantly falls off. You want to initiate IV antibiotics and also include IV antifungals due to the proximal nature of a leak. Again, this is referring to a gastrojejunostomy. And if you're in the operating room, that's an opportunity to establish an enteral nutrition route, such as placing a gastrostomy tube in the remnant. We will sometimes employ intraoperative endoscopy with insufflation if we're having difficulty finding the leak, um, especially if there is significant inflammation and adhesions, which can be challenging. We need a skilled endoscopist to help in this regard. If you can't explicitly see the leak, you should A, consider, are you looking in the right spot? Meaning make sure you evaluate the distal anastomosis. If that looks fine and you're convinced it is the proximal anastomosis, but you can't find or see it, it's appropriate to widely drain the space by leaving drains both anterior and posterior to the GJ and performing an omentopexy. Again, these concepts are, uh, and techniques are familiar to the vast majority of general surgeons. Let's talk about some non-operative alternatives for leak management. And these are employed really in more select stable patients like ours, for example, in this case. The principles are similar, but the modalities are different. Again, you wanna initiate IV antibiotics and IV antifungals. You want to employ or start TPN or consider percutaneous enteral access for nutrition. Um, interventional radiology, uh, can assist with percutaneous drainage of an infection or fluid collection, and endoscopic scent placement can often be employed to seal the hole or coverage uh, and close the leak. Endoscopic interventions kind of in the, in the modern era right now can include and even combine the following. Um, endoscopic suturing of a leak, such as using the Apollo overstitch or the X-TAC device, uh, using an over-the-scope clip, uh, covered stent placement, uh, and sometimes employing internal drainage with a double pigtail stent, which often can be used to help uh, manage a contained leak and help that drain back into the intraluminal space, such as with a sleeve gastrectomy. These techniques all require considerable endoscopic expertise and resources and may not be widely available. Let's kind of focus back on some general principles to consider when managing uh, an early leak. Uh, again, obtaining imaging studies uh, are an important means of diagnosis, but it also means understanding your facility's capacities and weight limits. If you suspect a leak despite negative imaging studies, you need to go to the operating room with that patient. Same with the patient deteriorating. Worst case uh, scenario in a situation with limited resources, um, and we actually see this quite often with smaller uh, critical access hospitals transferring patients to us, in a sick patient, you've got to take them to the operating room, perform the laparotomy, wash out and widely drain, uh, put an abdominal wound back if the patient is sick and you can't close the abdomen and transfer them to a higher acuity facility. Some intraoperative pearls, um, you know, laparoscopy is totally appropriate for management if you have the expertise. If not, laparotomy is very appropriate to perform. 
as always, make sure you dis evaluate the distal anastomosis because although it's rare, that can be a site of leak. Um, intraoperative endoscopy can be helpful, not only for localization, but sometimes therapeutic if you have uh, people with the right skills. Uh, when we're using intraoperative endoscopy to help find a leak, we always put a bowel clamp on the proximal small bowel to help reduce distension and loss of working space when we're performing a laparoscopic evaluation. And it's important to recognize that non-operative management, although appealing and very appropriate in certain instances, can be equally, if not more complex than operative. Um, it often involves coordinating radiology, interventional radiology, ICU teams, GI teams. And sometimes you don't have all these players in place to help perform or uh, create the ideal management situation. And it's important to recognize that. As always, get a bariatric surgeon involved ASAP or consider transfer to a higher level of care or a, a larger facility when you don't have the resources needed for definitive management. You ought to have a high index of suspicion if the patient's physiology points to an early leak despite negative imaging studies. The core principles of managing surgical sepsis are really what we're talking about here. Washout, closure if possible, wide drainage, and establishing enteral access for nutrition. In a more stable patient with the right equipment and expertise, Percutaneous and endoscopic therapies are playing a greater role in leak management, and these are really institution dependent. And as always, get help and transfer as appropriate to get that patient to the place that can provide definitive care. Thank you for the opportunity to present today, and I welcome your questions and comments.